Hello, everyone. First of all, thanks for joining the session. Through the last few years, search has been evolving a lot from its basic keyword search till the recent retrieval augmented generative search use cases, right? But still, one thing is very clear. The keyword search is still being the primary workforce of almost every search engines. And yes, it is time to rediscover your keyword search. So let's expand, enrich, and rewrite your keyword search. Myself, Praveen Morgan Prasad. I'm working as an analytics specialist with Amazon. And I have with me Hager, who is co-presenting with me today. Hager, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Praveen. Uh, I'm Hager Boafif, and I am an open search solutions architect working at AWS. Thank you. OK, first, let's start with some basics, OK? So first of all, information retrieval can be broadly classified into two categories. One is the sparse retrieval. Another one is dense retrieval. So the lexical search, also known as the keyword search, like follows this sparse retrieval mechanism. So here, what do we do? Like you have an uh, inverted index where you have a vocabulary. This vocabulary is going to have the list of unique, the unique list of tokens across your entire corpus, right? And, and you have the list of documents that you indexed. So a score is going to be generated between every unique token and every unique document in your corpus. And this is going to be based upon term frequency and also considering the inverse document frequency. That's called as the algorithm TF-IDF, or the enhanced version is best match 25. On the other hand, we have the dense retrieval mechanism, which is the vector search. So here you encode your documents and queries into high dimensional vectors, and you get these vectors from machine learning models, which were trained from scratch or fine-tuned from a pre-trained model, like to understand the sem semantic similarity between the text elements. And then you, like you, uh, given a query vector, you're going to find the nearest document vector using algorithms such as exact KNN or approximate K nearest neighbor algorithms by calculating the distance or the angle between your query vector and the document vector. This is on a high level, but let's go even into uh, deep into the, uh, the, phone, the uh, mechanisms on which they work. <clears throat> Let's talk, let's compare, uh, talk about the strengths of these two approaches, okay? First of all, lexical search, also known as keyword search, is very good at exact matching. Think about the use cases where you want to match by user IDs or phone numbers or people names. You should go for key, uh, lexical search. And it gives good explainability of results. Like, you know, like why the particular document was given as a result for your query, why the score was obtained, all those interpretability is very well, well versed with lex lexical search. And importantly, it requires less memory and provides results with very lower latency. On the vector search, on the vector search, like you have vector search is very well capable of doing contextual matching, right? Because the machine learning model that produces your vectors like understands the semantic similarity between like the particular tokens or the document and query vectors. So it gives results based upon the context, not just the keyword match. That's the reason vector search has been, is able to understand the natural language discrepancies and becoming a popular use cases in RAG. Not only that, vector search, with vector search, you can handle multimodality of elements, which means you can encode your text, images, uh, audio, video, anything into vectors and do, uh, and do this uh, uh, nearest neighbor search. So another important parameter uh, that you should also consider to compare these two approaches is generalization. How, how well these two approaches generalize like on, on different domain data with or without fine tuning. That's where a research was conducted, beer, benchmarking information retrieval. So here 18 uh, data sets were taken coming from different domains. And then this generalization was tested between the uh, keyword search and, yeah, and the vector search. The results were quite surprising. The vector search was found that it, it poorly generalizes on the out-of-domain data, which means whenever your machine learning model is not trained on the particular data which you are dealing with, then vector search provided results with less quality compared to a keyword search. So that's where it was found that vector search works great, but it needs fine tuning. 
that's, that's where the next question comes. Like what it takes to fine tune your vector search, right? Like it starts first with creating a synthetic data set. You need a big training data set, either from your search logs or you need to uh, generate using large language models. And then you need your data science team to uh, train a machine learning model from scratch or fine tune it over a pre-trained model. And finally, you have to retrain your model as and when you get your new documents. So like, you get new updates for your documents or set of new documents. You have to retrain your model completely, which means you have to re-index your all, all documents to the new uh, vector uh, that, that you're going to get from the retrained model. So that's where fine-tuning vector search is, great, is, is complex to get the exact usefulness of your uh, vector search results. So now we just talked about both the approaches, right? But now we have a question. So can, can, can I do semantic search with the lexical search or with the keyword search itself so that I don't have to undergo this complex fine tuning with the vector search? That's the question we have, right? I will leave the investigation and the further analysis with Hejo. Thanks, Pravin. All right, let's dive deep into uh, this question. Can we do semantic search with lexical search? In order to answer the question, we first need to understand what is missing in the lexical search in order to have the same semantic search capabilities as within the vector search, if we may compare. Let's start with this example of document that we uh, index in our uh, search engine. Exercising regularly makes body and mind stronger and healthy. And now, let's say we'll be running lexical search. And the query will be, how to strengthen the physical and mental wellness. So with a raise of hand, do you think there will be a match here using lexical search? Raise your hand if you think there will be a match. Okay. Majority are saying no match, which is correct, no match. Why is that? This is because lexical search will try to match the tokens in your queries with the tokens in your documents. So here, we don't have the exact tokens between the query and the document. However, if we dig deep into it, we have the token body and physical. They are related. They're not the exact token, but they are related. Semantically related, contextually re related. The same for mind and mental. Stronger and healthy with the token strength and wellness. So here, actually, as a user, why not? I did not. Why I did not get this match, right? This is where we hit the challenges with keyword search or lexical search, vocabulary mismatching, and poor semantic understanding of the words. So there are some solutions to um, overcome these challenges somehow, like having synonym files, maintaining your synonym over time, updating it frequently to make sure that you capture all the synonyms that or all tokens that your users are using in uh, on their search queries. Use analyzers, uh, try out different boosting techniques. However, these uh, techniques can be challenging to maintain. It can bring an overhead to your team to maintain over time. You can also build other uh, advanced capabilities Abilities, capturing your user signals uh, on the search application and re-rank your uh, search results based on your user behavior. This is where the text expansion techniques comes to rescue. So if we have the run the text expansion with lexical search, it may give us the semantic search capabilities. And the text expansion is composed mainly of three elements. Rewriting the tokens into synonyms, cinema, uh, sin similar tokens, injecting new terms that are semantically matching or similar to the original tokens, and then providing a weight to these generated tokens. And this weight will prov provide the information how much that new token is related to the original token, is semantically related and matching to the original token. So if you take the same document example, for example, for the exer token exercising or the word exercising, it would be related to exercise, 
Uh, we will inject new uh, tokens like workouts, training, activity, gym, and the same for the rest of the uh, tokens available in your query. Now the, um, the last part, which is boosting decay the feature. Features means like these are the list of tokens that we have generated um, uh, and the, the weights. We'll see now how how this or how these weights will help us to um, provide that semantic understanding as we are looking for. So if you take these two documents, Apple products are expensive. The second document, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. So both documents are using the same term, apple, right? But they are com in two complete contextual uh, scope. If we apply the text expansion on the first document, for example, we will have items like uh, expensive chips, or like store, budget, iPhone, even Steve. So uh, the scope is related to Apple products. And in the same document, it's more on the health uh, aspect or contextual uh, scope. Like we have medical, prevent, fruit, diet. Uh, so it clearly understands what's the uh, scope or the context of that document. And the list of values that you see in front of each token, that's the weight that is given by the, uh, the text expansion technique. We'll do the same at the query time. So here, let's say the query Apple headphones. Let's, let's assume we are looking for Apple headphones. We'll run the expansion on the query in itself as well. So here we have tokens like music, sound, phone, electronics, etc. And these tokens are more related to the uh, document one, as we can see, right? So now, um, in terms of calculating which document will be more relevant to uh, these, this query in particular, we'll simply do a dot product of the weights with the documents and the uh, weights with the uh, expanded tokens in your query. And uh, the highest the score is the more uh, semantically related or uh, more relevant to your query. So here, document one is clearly more relevant and has a higher score than uh, the second document. In lexical search, for example, we may have two documents uh, as, a, as a search result without any big difference. But with the um, a lex text expansion technique, we can have a big difference between the scoring here in order to highlight that document one is more relevant in this case. Now, in order to uh, build the text expansion uh, technique, uh, we will be running a demo later. We are using OpenSearch as a search engine. If you are not aware of OpenSearch, it is an open source search uh, engine that um, help you or to build like your machine learning search, um, multimodal search, hybrid, conversational search, and also lexical search. However, the focus today will be on neural sparse search that is uh, introduced in OpenSearch 2.11, and it will provide us with uh, capabilities to do document and query expansion that we described. So the text expansion um, technique is made possible using machine learning models uh, called encoding, uh, sparse encoding models. Uh, one of the most popular ones are Splayed. And open source, ha open, source, open source has also released open source uh, sparse encoding models. Uh, and uh, this one we can use to uh, encode the document and query. OpenSearch and also Splayed released a document-only uh, encoding model to generate the encodings um, at ingest time, so offline. And at search time, you can use a tokenizer. Uh, this is a, an open source tokenizer model that is also released by OpenSearch. It is open source and um, available on Hugging Face that you can so you can download it and uh, use it. Now, if you take the first approach, uh, document and search query sparse encoding on a high level architecture design. So you have the ingest phase and the uh, search phase. For the ingestion phase, first you will start by selecting what 
which fields to expand, right, from your uh, document data set. You will pass it through the sparse encoding model to generate the sparse vectors, uh, store the sparse vector uh, with your other metadata into your open search index. The sparse vectors, they are the list of features that we've seen earlier. So the, the new uh, generated tokens with their weights. And at search time, you will do the same for the search query. So you run the search query by the sparse encoding model, uh, generate the query sparse vector, and then you run your search uh, using the uh, open search index in this case. For the document-only sparse encoding, the ingestion phase does not change. Okay, so you still need to expand your fields offline and store the uh, sparse vector in open search index. And at search time here, uh, you can use the neural sparse uh, tokenizer model that I explained, and you can also provide uh, the uh, the um, your file with the um, tokens inverse document frequency or IGF, basically, uh, to use it uh, for your uh, search. Otherwise, all tokens will be uh, defaults to one. And then you will run the search query. So this approach actually brings better latency in terms of search. So um, document uh, and search encoding is good. However, you expect more latency at search time than document only. Now I said that we'll be running a demo uh, in a few minutes to explain how this works uh, with a real example. Here we are deploying a uh, web application on an EC2 instance, on Compute instance. It's a Streamlit application that uses OpenSearch uh, as a backend to store our data and run the neural sparse search. We are hosting uh, the encoding, sparse encoding machine learning model on Amazon SageMaker. And uh, this is for a reason uh, that we'd like to make it easier for us to run the remote inference with an open search. So if you have, let's say, you are deploying your sports encoding model uh, outside of SageMaker, let's say, in your own de development environment, you would need to generate the sparse vector outside of open search and then store the sparse vector in open search. Uh, the same for query time. You need to generate the sparse vector for your query at query time and then use that sparse vector to run your search. Now with the um, new ML connector feature powered by ML machine learning common plugins and open search, uh, we can actually um, call, call the machine learning model, the bioencoder model in SageMaker uh, using ingest pipeline with an open search and run the uh, sparse encoding process inside open search. So you index your documents as they are, and the ingest pipeline it will uh, transform your your data into sparse vector. Now, uh, the steps to do this, so first, uh, once you deploy your machine learning model, you create the uh, ML connector, you will create the sparse ingest pipeline, and here you will define or specify the processor, that is sparse encoding processor available in open search. You will call the model ID that is hosted identif model identifier hosted in Amazon SageMaker, and you will define your source fields and the uh, destination fields where you'll be storing the sparse vector. Then you will create your sparse index. You will define the pipeline as the default pipeline to run the uh, remote inference and generate the sparse vectors uh, at ingest time. And then you will also need to uh, store your sparse vector in um, field type of type rank features in order to use the weights in your scoring calculation later. And last, you will run the neural sparse search by specifying the type of query as neural sparse. And uh, the same process for bioencoder. So you here you will call the model identifier so, uh, stored in, uh, hosted in SageMaker to uh, generate the sparse encoding at search time. All right, now let's move quickly to the uh, demo. This is my chat. Okay, see my screen now. All right. 
So this is the web application uh, that uh, we host on EC2. And now we'll start to, uh, with the lexical search. Okay, so we have a query. We're looking for pink backpack. And we'll run the search query uh, using lexical search. So in terms of results here, we have an exact match with the uh, pink backpack for the first two results. You see the highlighted uh, terms in orange uh, color. And then the third one, we have a match with backpack. And then we have a match with pink token. However, they're not at all related to bags context, right? So we have shirt, we have flowers. So as a user, this is not relevant to me. Now let's run the neural sparse search. And run the search query. So here we are using the by encoder, meaning that we are expanding both document and query. For the query part, we have picked some examples that have been generated, like the tokens that have been uh, injected with their weights. So you can see, for example, we have bag, we have new terms, we have bag, we have pack, coral, that is uh, similar to uh, pink, and we have the relevant associated weights. Now, checking the results, the two results, the two first results, that they're not uh, different from lexical search. However, if we check the uh, rest of the results, we have pink bags. They're not backpacks, but they are in the same scope or contextual scope as the backpack. So in this case, if you have, let's say, you don't have enough items to showcase your customers or your end user on your application, this gives them more flexibility in choosing other terms or cho choosing other products that are similar to what they are looking for. Not necessarily exact match, but at least uh, they are similar to their intention on what they are looking for. And here we can see the expanded terms on document as well. Uh, we can capture feminine here, for example, uh, bag, color, etc. All right. Now that um, we understood how a sparse search works, uh, we will uh, give it back to Praveen to explain the benchmarks, the performance implication here, and how to uh, go to build your neural sparse search, uh, starting from your lexical search. Thanks. Thanks, Hager. OK, so like, we just understood how neural sparse search in open search works, right? But most of us have the uh, lexical search already in place. So now the question is, how do you transform yourself from lexical search to the neural sparse search? OK, first of all, choose the right uh, encoding machine learning model, the list one from the list that he just shown, and then identify the fields that you want to convert into sparse vectors. This is where you should pay attention, like from your search logs, which, like, which, which are the fields where your user search queries are getting a maximum number of hits or misses. Take those fields and subject them to expansion to convert to sparse vectors. And number three is like create a, a, a new uh, sparse index with the rank features field, the one that is going to hold your uh, token and the weight combinations. And then you're going to re-index the entire documents from the lexical search into this new rank feature index. And the next step is going to be like you're going to run both the lexical search and the neural sparse search in parallel. This is an important step where you're not completely migrating to neural sparse search because with the same index, the rank features index, you can run both the searches in place. So here is where you're going to run the queries in hybrid mode. And finally, adjust the weightage to the neural sparse search. Increase the weightage to the neural sparse search from the lexical search as you do the uh, A-B testing and perform this in a phased rollout approach. And this is going to be an iterative process until you meet the relevant benchmarks from your uh, uh, ground truth results. Just some quick numbers that we have on how these uh, open search neural sparse models uh, compare in terms of uh, quality, like this is the comparison between the uh, basic keyword search and the uh, dense vector search. As you see here, this challenge was done again on the same 18 data sets from Beer, and it was found that the NDCG, the uh, quality, one of the quality metrics, 
of the neural sparse search of both the models of open search, the by encoder and the document only encoder was higher than the NDCG of the lexical and the vector search standalone by at least five points. And number two, number the second important point is that there was no fine tuning applied on any of the models which were used here. Okay, on this particular data sets. That's an important point to be noted because you can relate back to vector search where I said you need fine tuning to make it work better. Okay, so you don't have to fine tune, like this were the results on these data sets where no fine tuning was applied but still it was performing better compared to the standalone lexical and the keyword search. These uh, numbers is again on uh, the latency and the memory requirements. The top right corner of the table, uh, the box you see is the configuration on which this was tested. It was found that on the latency side, the uh, bi-encoder model, the neural sparse bi-encoder model, like had a higher latency compared to dense vector search because you do the inference both on the document and the query side, right? So that query side is increasing the latency compared to dense vector search. But at the same time, the, the document-only encoder in the neural sparse search was competitive with the lexical search latency. So that's where if you have latency-critical workloads, think about starting your experiment with neural sparse search with a document-only encoder. This is on the memory requirement, like the dense vector search uh, like involved, uh, involved utilization of RAM compared to the neural sparse search of both the models. And this, uh, it, it required 7.9 percentage increase in RAM compared to the neural sparse search of both the models. Mm -hmm. and, and the neural sparse search, both the by encoder and the document only encoder, the memory utilization was roughly same as that of the lexical search. This is an important point because you don't have to keep scaling out your cluster just to meet your memory requirements, which happens in vector search. Okay, so we just covered one uh, technique on text expansion using neural sparse search with open search. That's not all, we have other two techniques, enrich and rewrite. Let's see how it works to make, it, to make your lexical search work like a semantic search. First of all, why do you need to enrich your documents? Think about a use case, right? Like if you have your documents expanded, like enriched with additional attributes, then you can use those additional attributes to be used as filters later when your, when your users hit a query, right? Consider this uh, uh, example where you have a retail search use case and at the left box you have a uh, sample product where you just have the image of the product, description of the product and price of the product. Now you enrich your, this image document with say Amazon recognition, one from the Amazon AI stack services or you could use open source object detection models to do this enrichment of uh, the image and then you pass the image to one of these models and now you see the enriched attributes at the right side. In addition to description and price, you see color, category, and, and the additional objects that you see in that particular image. This is what you can, you can break down as filters when your, query, when your user hits a query. The same applies to text. Think about a use case where you want to uh, uh, do a multilingual search. You can identify the language coming from the text of the document and store the language as a part of your document. Also, you can identify entities of your text document and then store all those entities in your uh, uh, index as well so that now you have a list of additional attributes explaining your document more. And this, this can be done using Amazon Comprehend, again one from the uh, Amazon AI stack services, or you can use open source named entity recognition models. Okay, so once you have an enriched document stored in your open search index, say like you have a query brown leather shoes for men under $50. Like just pay, uh, pay attention on the filters that you have on your query, right? Brown as a color, men for gender, leather for material, and 50 is for price, right? Lot of filters inside one query, and you can't expect your users to put in all as, to mark all those facet filters. I'm lazy so that I just type my query. I just want those filters to be applied automatically. If you have an enriched document, instead of using this ma uh, the, uh, uh, the basic DSL query such as match or a query string where you just point the user query directly to one particular field, since you have enriched document, you can break down those, uh, break down your query elements and map them to particular filters uh, 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 as per your enriched uh, document uh, attributes. So now the question is, 
how do you break down your query into that filter so that you can map it to the attributes, right? For that, you can use, you can leverage large language models uh, where uh, you can give them uh, a detailed prompt given, given the query, given the index schema, and given some examples. First, you ask a large language model to generate a structured query output where you have all the logical and the comparison operators mapping your attribute to the respective uh, query broke down filters. And then you write your own rules to convert the structured query output from the large language model into, into your domain specific language. Here, we have used open search query DSL to write those custom rules to convert that structured query, but it depends on your domain specific language. Now let's quickly see how this works. Yeah, this is a notebook I have, just quick demonstration of how this works so that from the developer point of perspective you understand. Yeah, this is a notebook I have for quick demonstration on like how to do it from the developer end. Like this is not an end-to-end yeah, uh, -end development but just a flavor of how you can think about uh, developing this. Okay, we are using Langchain as an SDK, as a framework to talk to the large language models here. And uh, on the, for the large, large language model, we use Anthropic Cloud, uh, the Sonnet variant from Bedrock. And these are the inputs that we pass to the uh, uh, large language model as a, uh, as a part of the prompts. First, the input query. Uh, the second is the index mapping with the complete list of field names. And importantly, the description of the field names. That helps the large language model to understand, to put map it to respective fields breaking down the query. And then examples, few examples of how that uh, looks for the large language model. These are some examples I have here. For example, here I say like uh, for uh, black leather shoes, you see here, uh, I say the, the output is going to, should be something like query shoes, the main topic of the query without any filters, and filter separately as color as black, material as leather, and category as footwear. And then you give your uh, prompt where you, which, you, which you want to convert it into the respective structured output. And this is where you give the detailed uh, uh, instruction to the large language model how to do that. This is a prompt directly taken from Langchain self-query retriever. We just took that and we enhanced it upon. So it's like you take, it, you take something from this, uh, something that's already available and do your uh, instruction details upon that. We took from Langchain and we add our own details there. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is how the structured uh, output looks like. You see brown leather shoes for men. I got query as shoes, the important topic of the query, and filter as everything, color as brown, material as leather, gender as male, category as food pair, and so on. And now I write my own rules to convert this into open search understandable query DSL. I say EQ should be equal to term, term query, content should be a match query, like should be a fuzzy query, and and should be a must query, should be a must class, must filter, or should be a should filter, and so on. This is where you understand your user's queries from your logs to convert them into respective filters. And based upon my rules, this is what I have got with must filters, and uh, with, with must filters like where every uh, uh, every attribute has been mapped to a query filter, and finally the important topic of the query, which is shoes. Okay, so we'll see how this uh, looks with an example. Yeah. We'll just go through a quick example for you. Okay. Okay, consider this query, black jacket for men under $120. Let me zoom in a bit. Yeah. So you see here, this, the same query has a lot of filters in it, which is applicable filters. So first, like, I'll do a basic uh, lexical search query without no enriching and no rewritten re queries. Uh, so you see these are the documents. Uh, you see the, you got jackets, but you also got some shirts. And also the color is not so... The, the one that you asked for, which is black here, 
and also you see if you, if you open the metadata of the document, the default metadata of the document, the uh, price is greater than the $120 which I have asked for. And also you got some irrelevant uh, results, okay? So now what I do is I enrich the documents and rewrite the query D, uh, using large language model. And let's see how this query is broken down into filters now. Okay, so this is it. now I got a different result. First of all, let's see how the query has been rewritten. You see now I got a query with bool class which should filters where all the uh, uh, filters has gone into the should class like or condition, color as black, gender as male, style as jacket, and the price less than 120 is also into the should class. Whereas the must class has the category as apparel and uh, the jacket, the query jacket, which is the important topic of the query is inside the must class. That's, that's where like you can avoid irrelevant results for your query. And now I got this, and also you see for every document, I have some enriched documents, which is the Amazon recognition result, the object detection models result. You see the color black, I obtained only by, by enriching my document using that machine learning model. And now like I got uh, these results, respecting most of the filters that I have in the query, color as black, price is also less than 120, and here the price is greater than 120, but because it's in the R class, but most of the results are relevant with matching the, uh, all the filters. And again, he, here is where you write your own rules. Like for example, I have just added category as a must filter here. If you want price, gender, color, should all, all be respected from your search query as hot filters, then dry, write your own rules that explain the last snippet in the notebook. So now if you see, if I just rerun the same query with these as must, must filters, you will see all the uh, filters coming into must category here. And I see like every uh, document is like respecting every filter, including the price less than $120. And I also got a new document here, which is again less than $120. So all the filters are respected. You get, you get to understand your user's, user's intention perfectly and match them as filters just by using keyword search. You're not doing any magic with vectors or anything here. Okay, this is, this is the entire life cycle, like how lexical search will look with all these components in place, okay? You do, you do enrich, you enrich your documents and uh, uh, you enrich and expand your documents on the ingestion phase and on the search side, again, you expand it using neural sparse search and optionally apply filters by using rewritten option from the large language model, okay? So you can, you can combine the options that we told, like the one neural sparse search, in addition, uh, you can uh, uh, enrich the documents and uh, uh, apply filters for your neural sparse query based upon the technique that I discussed here. These are the uh, uh, final key takeaways, like just as a summary of whatever we uh, uh, took in the entire slides. First, uh, uh, think of, uh, like, try with neural sparse search by encoder, the document only encoder models available with open search and split. And you, uh, you, can, you can use AIML connectors of open search if you have your models in Amazon SageMaker. It's like direct connection. You don't have to maintain that middleware components to do the transaction of uh, text into vectors or anything. And you enri like enrich enough your documents with, with the uh, entity recognition models or object detection models and then try to rewrite it with large language models. And one thing with large language models is that Start with the existing frameworks such as Langchain or Haystack. We started with there and were able to improve the Langchain's prompting, Langchain's examples, and we were able to reach a point that it was working reasonable on this small data set. And again, for all the things, measure, evaluate, and iterate. That's a very important thing. You should have a ground truth data set, measure, evaluate, and iterate till you reach your relevant benchmarks. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Okay, who has questions? Hello, yeah, can you hear me okay? Uh, okay, thank you for a great, great presentation. So I actually have tried the spray model. Uh, I try to use the spray model in our search engines, but one problem we face is that the count and also the aggregation facets have like exploded after applying the like, uh, spray model. 
So that's open source supports like truncation methods or like uh, some threshold to truncate those results, like has risk relevant on like scores or like any threshold. That's a good question. We yeah. engage in an analysis discussion about this particular aspect. Yeah, so you want to you take yeah. Um, so it depends whether you're using uh, by encoder, like uh, encoding for sure. both document and query, or only a document. Yeah, it would be it around like, like 200 totally uh, new tokens in generally, like on average, I would say, uh, for document only. And if you're doing document and query uh, encoding, it will be a bit less. Just take into consideration this uh, aspect, right. indeed, so you don't want to expose awesome. your uh, yeah, field you. sizes. Yeah. Just one additional point there to what our Hager said. See, like, for now we don't have the filter threshold filter inside open sure, search itself. Sure. Okay, but that, that's 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 a good okay. feature request that I agree yeah. with. But what you can do is like what I also tried is like I we we did the uh, sparse vector conversion outside and we applied the filters based upon some threshold say like greater than 0 0.4 0 0.3. Do that on client side and then apply the vectors for the search. That's another way of doing it, but it's not natively supported now, but that's that's a good feature request that we can yeah, propose to our service team. Yeah, I actually tried the exact, exact method that you okay. mentioned, but uh, I wanted that to, uh, I wanted search engine to support that natively. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a good feature request. Yeah. yeah, we have a proposal already. Uh, yeah, so actually I have a follow-up question on that. So if I want to expand the if I want to expand only the search query, and let's say for the expansion, I find 15, 20 different search queries. So I understand r right now there is no solution for it, but do you have any thought on how do you find the threshold, for example, uh, to find the top matching search, expanded search query for a given search? One word answer, experiment. Experiment, like for this data set is around like 10K samples we have in the demo data set, okay? We just experimented with what is the actual threshold that should be suitable for our uh, uh, demo data from the search logs, from the results that we found. Okay, this this truncation of filters should really do do uh, do work. Yeah, experiment. Uh, I don't know which one of you was first. Okay. I think you were probably first. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, actually, I tried Splay two years ago, and um, it was a nightmare when it came to find or to try to tune Splate for another language than English. Have you tried? Uh, no? OK. No. Like, as far as I know, there is no multilingual support yeah. for text expansion from any of the providers, including Open Search and Splate, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, but I think if you do the fine tuning, that would be the first uh, state of the art like in terms of multilingual for text expansion. But yeah, I haven't come through the use cases of multilingual. OK, yeah. too bad for me. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, did you train your own models for the sparse retrieval, or did you use the pre-trained Splate stuff? Okay, and, and the, the, the demo that you see is using open search sparse encoder models, and this sparse encoder model was trained from scratch yeah. by our data science team, and this is on MS Marco data set. Ah, this is okay. fine-tuned to MS. Yeah, so, so it, it is trained. It is trained. MS Marco um, passage retrieval. Exactly, yeah, okay. exactly, that you have like 8.8 .8 million documents. That's where the model was uh, uh, trained upon from the scratch. And again, uh, that's why you see in, in our performance benchmarks, MS Marco will not be there because it was fine-tuned upon it. Mm -hmm. It was just tested on other data sets to understand the generation capabilities. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is all we have time for. Thank you so much for your presentation.